Thank you, Dr. Wood, for the introduction. Thank you all for coming. It's uh, great to see familiar faces, friends among you here, and to come to MD Anderson on a beautiful spring weekend of Easter. This is, uh, shows your motivation and your advocacy for this field. So this is my disclosure slide. So this is a timeline of the uh, several of the th therapies we have now for Rian carcinoma. So we have 11 therapies approved by the FDA and are available in the clinic, starting with high dose interleukin-2 in 1992. And over the past decade or so, we've had 10 therapies come from December 2005 with the first target agent, sorafenib, and then a month later, sunitinib, which you heard about from Dr. Yonash, and then Temsirolimus, which you heard about him also, the mTOR inhibitor in 2007. And uh, while several of these agents you know, can be used in the first line or second line or beyond, really what I show, I show here in, the, in this is the five drugs that are used in the second line and beyond, meaning third line, fourth line, etc. cetera. Everolimus, the mTOR inhibitor, the brand is called Affinitor, and Axitinib, which was approved in 2012, and that's called Inlita. That's another VEGF TKI, a, a drug that starves the blood vessels, that starves the tumor by blocking the blood vessels. And then uh, three therapies came in the past uh, 18 months or so, and that's the immune checkpoint inhibitor nivolumab, or Aptivo, in November 2015, and then uh, in 2016, in April, Cabozantinib, Cabometics, and then this, this doublet, or this uh, pair here of linvatinib, another tyrosine kinase inhibitor, a drug that targets the blood vessels plus other things. And then again, we see here Everolimus being paired in combination. So since 2015, you know, the RCC landscape for second line and beyond has rapidly changed. And here we have these therapies, and I'll be going through each one of these trials that led to the approval of these therapies. Uh, nivolumab, I'll start with nivolumab first, the check, and the study that brought it uh, is Checkmate 025. Then I'll show data from the Meteor trial that brought in cabozantinib, and then a study called uh, 205 that brought in lenvatinib plus everolimus. So it's important to note that all those three trials were conducted in patients with the most common type of kidney cancer, uh, the clear cell uh, or conventional type renal cell carcinoma. And it's also important to note that the majority of patients uh, treated on these trials had good or intermediate risk disease. And I would like to thank Dr. Yonash for the glossary he provided uh, so I don't have to go through this again, the definitions of what good intermediate and poor risk means and coupling mild curves progression-free survival and overall survival, et cetera. So first, starting with nivolumab. This is the design of the Checkmate 025 study. So patients with clear cell, again, the most common type of renal cell carcinoma, were recruited to the study after they had already up to three prior therapies before they got on to this trial. And those uh, patients had to have one or two VEGFR TKI, meaning drugs that are approved in the first line setting, such as sunitinib or pezoptinib that you heard from Dr. Yonash. They could have received also interleukin-2. So they could have received up to three prior therapies, including interleukin-2. They could have received one or two of these frontline therapies, the oral agents uh, that are FDA approved sunitinib or pezoptinib. And then once they, uh, they are screened and they are found to be eligible, they qualify for enrollment on the trial, they get randomized, meaning half the patients, it's like tossing a coin, uh, half the patients get Everolimus standard of care for second line at that time, of the time of the enrollment of the, on the trial. And the other half of the patients, the other group, will receive this immune checkpoint inhibitor, nivolumab, at the dose shown there. The primary endpoint, meaning the, the first goal and the goal of that trial and the primary endpoint is overall survival. So the interest is to show whether patients who are fairly grouped or randomized to receive this drug or that drug with one of the two therapies, the two arms of the trial, show a survival advantage over the other one. So here, obviously, here the interest was to see if 
nivolumab treated patients with the immune checkpoint inhibitor, that is, will have a better super, uh, survival than patients who receive the standard of uh, care agent, the mTOR inhibitor, Everolimus. And here you, you heard about the Kaplan mark curves, what it means. So this is for the overall survival. So that's the primary endpoint. So that means that from the day they receive the first dose, whether the oral agent represented in yellow here, or the IV immune checkpoint inhibitor, nivolumab, or Abdivo here in, in red. So the clock starts ticking from the first dose they receive, and patients are followed, and uh, you know, those who are survived, who survive are censored, meaning they do not have the event, they didn't uh, die from the cancer. And so, and when you, you, the statisticians, you know, plot these uh, curves, and that's what's called the Kaplan-Meier curves. And if you can run a, like here, the, the, the arrow, or if you have a laser, uh, you can, pointer you can use, if you can run that between the lines, then it, it looks like there is really a separation of the curves, and the, there is one, the top line, patients represented by the top curve, have a better survival. And indeed, patients who were treated with nivolumab had a better survival than patients who were treated with Everolimus. And the median, and you know, median means, you know, I think in layman term, the closest you can say, it's average, basically. The median was a little over two years or 25 months for the nivolumab treated patients versus 19.6 uh, months. So how you translate that into hazard ratio? The hazard ratio was 0.73, which means that there was a reduction of 27% mortality, 27% reduction of mortality in patients who received nivolumab. And that was statistically significant. So this is, did not happen uh, due to uh, ha you know, just uh, random. It is because of the therapy. It didn't just a, a, a haphazard random occurrence. Now, as is the case with many of these immune therapies that we have in the clinic, including vaccines, for example, a vaccine that's FDA approved for prostate cancer patients, including interleukin-2 and including these immune checkpoint inhibitors, while survival is being shown to be superior for patients treated with these immune therapies, in this case here, the nivolumab, we simply don't really understand exactly why. We think we understand why, but the survival is, is better. But when you look at scans uh, and you look at time from dose one, first dose of therapy or uh, in the infusion, until there is progression or death, there's really no difference that's statistically, uh, statistically significant difference between the two arms. So somehow the immune therapy is helping these patients live longer, even if the kaplan meier curves for progression-free survival is not significantly different between the two arms. So and then there was a question, well, can we predict which patients, you know, are benefited, are surviving better, have a better chance then of being treated with this agent? Uh, you know, because every treatment that we give to our patients may have some side effects, so you won't try to give a treatment to the patients that are most likely to benefit from therapy. So this is one of those things that have, has been looked at. This actually is a good biomarker for lung cancer, uh, treat, who are patients with lung cancer who are treated with a similar immune checkpoint inhibitor called pembrolizumab, where there in lung cancer patients, if pdl one expression is high, like 50%, so meaning that those uh, cells have 50% or more uh, PDL1 expression in the tumor cells, then that predicts for benefit with this agent. However, in real cell carcinoma, at least in this trial, this did not pan out, meaning we could not really predict whether patients whose tumors had an expression. Here it's 1% uh, uh, above or less. It didn't, it didn't matter. So patients, regardless of the PDL1 expression on the on the tumor cells, responded to and benefited from nivolumab. Looking now on the response rate, about a quarter of the patients responded to nivolumab. Less than five percent responded to everolimus. 
And here, are, here is the time it took from you know, an average, again, median time to response. About three months it took patients to achieve or to demonstrate on their scans the response. And then here is the duration of response for both agents. Summary of the safety, what we refer to as adverse events or side effects of the therapy. Nivolumab uh, treated patients had fewer uh, any grade uh, adverse events compared to Everolimus, which Everolimus is, uh, by the way, is a drug that's not that toxic. It's an oral agent and has few side effects, but even compared to that drug, which is really not terribly toxic, nivolumab had fewer adverse events. And grade 3, 4 is, uh, you know, refers to the severity of the adverse event. And when you look here, you had 19 patients uh, treated with nivolumab had severe uh, adverse events compared to 37. So about twice more patients had severe adverse events with everolimus. And then when you look at uh, adverse events that led to discontinuation and, and removal of uh, patients from protocol, you have eight here, 8% 8 versus 13%. So more patients uh, had to come off protocol of this uh, Checkmate 0 to 5, who are treated with Everolimus. So now the second agent, cabozantinib. So here is a cartoon that really shows the interplay between the tumor cell and then what, uh, you know, this tumor cell produces and some of, you know, this drug that we are talking about, cabozantinib or cabometics, how it works. So as a result, and again, here the focus is clear cell, the most common type of real cell carcinoma. As a result, of VHL inactivation, which happens as a result of mutation in VHL or silencing of the gene by methylation. You have these things that happen, these uh, um, proteins, MET, axle, VEGF. And these are here in, in the, the uh, void things that we call the ligands for these receptors. So this drug, cabozantinib, blocks these three pathways, these three signaling pathways. And you, we, we know that VEGF helps tumors draw blood vessels from the patients to produce new blood vessels, the angiogenesis. And this, these two pathways, the MET and the axle and their ligands, hepatocytic growth factor and GAS6, help the tumor progress through growth, invasion, metastasis, and helps also resistance to VEGFR inhibition. So this is what this drug does, and this is the study that led to uh, its approval. So this is similar to the other study. This is a phase three, so it's it's large study. Patients had to receive any number, could have received any number of prior therapies, clear cell again, and then they were randomized to receive either this agent, which was at that time investigational, versus Everimus. Again, you see Everimus being the comparator or the uh, the, the, the arm that is basically standard of care. There was no crossover because not only uh, progression-free survival was primary endpoint here, but also overall survival. And then here, the couple of mark curves. Again, you can see here, you can uh, pass the pointer between the two arms. When it comes to progression-free survival, the patient treated with cabozantinib had a better, better progression-free survival than patient treated with everolimus. It was 7.4 months versus 3.9 months. When you look at the response rate, 17% versus 3%. When you look at now the overall survival, same thing. Patients treated with cabozantinib had a better survival than patients treated with everolimus. And here is the median for survival for both, 21 months versus 16 months. And that was is, is, is a difference that was statistically significant and led to the approval of this agent. When you look now about you know, exposure and dose reductions, this is not an easy drug to take, but uh, most patients actually were able to stay on therapy and only 9% uh, came off because of adverse events and 10% for the everolimus. But there was a higher rate of uh, dose reduction in patients treated with cabozantinib, 60% versus 25%. And the average dose that patients received of cabozantinib was 44 milligram from the starting dose of 60 milligram. And most patients on Avrimus received as close to the standard dose as, as can be. Now, this is the third uh, trial that, uh, was FDA, that led to the FDA approval of this combination. And here is 
this is the important thing to uh, bring to at your attention here is this is a phase two trial. It's not a phase three, so it's not as large as the phase three trial, and it doesn't have a hypothesis testing. So basically, the level of evidence uh, that's uh, it, uh, inferred from this is not considered as robust as phase three. However, the results were really impressive. So again, this is a second line study. Patients received, at, uh, received one prior therapy, not more than one prior VEGF RTKR, such as sinitinib or pazoptanib. And they were randomized to receive one of those three therapies. This combination or this agent by itself, linvatinib, or Evrimus. Again, you see Evrimus being the comparator. And then patients the, uh, were followed by scans, and they were stratified before they were randomized by the, the level of hemoglobin and the calcium. And here, when you look at the progression-free survival, again, kaplan mark curves, you see the patients who were treated with the combination had a better progression-free survival. The median was around 14 months compared to half that for patients who received, you know, the linvatinib single agent. That's the, the curve here represents patients who received a single agent linvatinib. And you see here, the patients who received Everolimus had a lower, a, a shorter sur, a median progression free survival of 5.5 months. And when you look at the, the same data, Kaplan-Meier uh, curves for progression free survival, but now not the physicians themselves doing the assessment of the scans, but an independent, independent neutral, objective, blinded radiologist to really see if this is, will be confirmed. You see basically the same separation. Around 12, point, uh, around 12 months median progression free survival for the combination versus nine months with a single agent in vatinib versus 5.6 months. So this is another way of looking at this. And when the FDA saw the data, they were impressed, even though this was a smaller study, phase two, not phase three, yet they decided to approve this therapy. And when you look at the survival, again, survival here was numerically better uh, for the combination than for these uh, other agents. In. So, again, this is a summary of the efficacy, higher, uh, longer progression-free survival, higher response rate by the assessment of the physicians who treated those patients. This was 43%, and uh, this is the, the median survival. When uh, you look at, uh, you know, again, uh, how long, and if you had duration, uh, dose reduction, this is a combination that's not easy to take. 71% uh, of the patients had to reduce the dose. Uh, 62 had to reduce the dose for this agent by itself. The combination, almost three quarters of the patient. And around a quarter of the patients had to come off study because of toxicity, because of the side effects. So this is a therapy that's toxic, although it is effective. And again, it is challenging to take two different drugs in combination uh, at the same time. So here is, so you saw that three trials showed an experimental agent or an, an investigational therapy being better, producing better results than Everolimus, the standard of care, the comparator. And here are the studies, uh, you know, side by side. And I put Axitinib because that's the, the, the trial, the drug that was approved in 2012. And none of these three uh, trials compared their agent with Axitinib. So Axitinib is still there. Uh, as a option to be uh, for our patients with uh, yeah, clear sarionsa carcinoma. So now, this is for you and this is for us physicians uh, at academic centers as well as in the community. And this is, this is important also for, uh, for uh, government officials or insurance uh, people to look at what are the considerations that we take into account that we factor when we select a, a, a second line therapy. I mean, when we have multiple choices, we have not just one we could use, but actually several different therapies we can choose in the salvage setting, in the second line or third line. How do we choose? What are the things we look at? This is what I believe uh, are the most important. Uh, and I start with the top, which is, I believe, the most important for me. And that's basically efficacy. As a patient, as well as a physician, I want to make sure that the first thing I want to give to a patient of mine is, is this drug going to prolong their life? Is this first going to cure them? I mean, ultimately, that's the ultimate goal. But if we cannot, if we don't have a curative therapy for every patient, can this drug 
prolong, which is of those drugs prolong survival. Second is the study that brought this drug didn't have the highest level of evidence. Was that a phase three trial, large number of phase treated? Thirdly, tolerability. Can patients tolerate this? And then cost is important. And then, you know, there is the convenience in oral agent versus intravenous. And then and there are some important things that we should not forget, and that's basically, did the patients who are now looking at taking a second line or third line drug, what side effects have they had from their prior therapy? Are they having high blood pressure? Are they taking three or four blood, pre med blood pressure medications? Do they have diabetes? Is it affecting their kidney function? Uh, do they have some immune uh, problems, such as, you, you know, do they have uh, myasthenia gravis? Do they have past history of Guillain-Barré? Because those are things that can basically uh, uh, force you to go one line, to, to one therapy over another, or to prefer to use one therapy over another because of those things. So in a, uh, an environment and a time where value-based care is talked about, this is what I believe uh, how these several therapies that I mentioned stack up. Everolimus by itself, except for select few patients, I think you show data for clear cell at least. We're not talking about chromophobe, we're not talking about papilla, we're not talking about these other rare tumors. We're talking about the clear cell, the most common type of clear cell. So there is enough now studies, I showed you three, that showed another therapy is better than everolimus. So it's hard for clear cell alone now to, there is little justification, justification to use it by itself uh, nowadays. So I would not go to it uh, in the second or third line or fourth line by itself unless it's been combined with something else. Accitinib, I think, is still remains an option, and I put it there, but I really believe that if, if you want survival, the accitinib trial that brought accitinib did not show uh, survival advantage over its comparator, sorafenib. But linvatinib and nevolimus I showed you did, so I would, I would go to that. And I would go to either nivolumab or cabozantinib. And there will be patients that I prefer to give nivolumab to rather than cabozantinib. And there will be patients that I would prefer to give cabozantinib rather than nivolumab. And, and these things that I mentioned, uh, your tolerability, what side effects uh, and uh, symptoms do they have from the prior therapies? Do they have immune, immune disorders that make me worry about giving them nivolumab and maybe prefer cabozantinib? Or do they have very bad blood pressure problem that makes me go with nivolumab. So what are, in the next three, four minutes, I'd like to speak about some of the emerging therapies. I showed you what's FDA approved, what's on the market now for use uh, for our patients, but now what's on the horizon? Because obviously we don't want to sit uh, and, and be satisfied with what we have, but we, we are looking at, you know, uh, pushing the envelope, bringing some new therapies, which clearly we're not curing everybody with uh, kidney cancer with these therapies. So hopefully we will do better in the future. So there are, the, here is a, a, uh, a, a slide summarizing, if you want, some of the novel treatment approaches that we have right now. And I, 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 don't, I will take a whole hour to speak about each one of these or uh, most of these. So I'll be selective in what I will be speaking about. But there are two novel exciting immune uh, therapies that are different than the immune checkpoint inhibitors that uh, you will hear about from Dr. Gao next. And that one of them is pegylated IL-2 or Nectar-214. This is the IL-2 that you know about that's been around decades. This is a, an improved version, if you want, a new formulation of interleukin-2 that doesn't have to be given in the hospital, in the ICU setting, but more in the outpatient setting. And it can be, more importantly, combinable with something like nivolumab, for example, or pembrolizumab. So I think we are conducting studies with piglet IL-2, and I think in combination with nivolumab, it's showing really impressive results. And then uh, we have planned to move forward with this agent in combination with immune checkpoint inhibitors. Another one that has been shown also to, to show good results as monotherapy and as well as in combination with immune checkpoint inhibitors is piglated into interleukin 10 or AM0010. This is Armo Biosciences, a small biotech company out of San Francisco. There is a class of uh, exciting drugs, HIF2-alpha inhibitors from Peloton. And we are uh, going to open a trial that Dr. Yonash will lead uh, uh, at our institution 
in uh, using a couple of these, uh, you know, agents that block HIF2 alpha, which is downstream from the VHL and upstream from VEGF. So it's it's a, a new class, a new way of uh, treating kidney cancer, at least again, clear cell, where this may, will be most relevant. But an important class of, of uh, agents that we are now uh, going to uh, push forward with is a class of agents that target the the metabolism, the, the metabolism of the tumor cells. And the first in this class is a drug called Calithera Biosensis or CB839 glutaminase inhibitor. And then uh, there is a new uh, sort of a different uh, axle met VHF inhibitor that's called MGCD516 or citravatinib. And that we will be doing a study with uh, at MD Anderson. So in the interest of time, we'll just go quickly here. This is a, a uh, cartoon rendering of the tumor cells and how the tumor cells take its nutrients, sugar, as well as the amino acid glutamine. So cancer cells require both glucose and glutamine for growth and survival. The TCA cycle or Krebs cycle is a critical source of ATP for cellular energy and several key biosynthetic intermediates for production of amino acids, nucleotides, and fatty acids. So in the absence of glucose, the amino acid glutamine is the primary source feeding the TCA cycle. So cancer cells become dependent on glutamine metabolism for efficient growth and survival. And glutaminase is a mitochondrial enzyme that catalyzes the conversion of glutamine here to glutamate that enters into that TCA cycle. And the drug CB839 is here. That's the one that's put in the brakes or blocks the conversion of glutamine to uh, glutamate. It blocks that enzyme glutaminase. So here is the design of the study we're going to be launching here uh, at MD Anderson. This is a multi-center trial, uh, and it's uh, 252 patients who were treated with any number of prior therapies, including nivolumab, including cabozantinib. And they will be randomized to receive Everolimus, which you heard about already, another, you know, a trial taken uh, using Neverolimus as a comparator, but in combination with placebo versus Everolimus again in combination with this drug CB839, that glutaminase inhibitor. The primary endpoint is progression-free survival. So the trial is not open anywhere uh, in the nation yet, but this trial will be open in the U.S. We will be leading it along with other sites, and it will be open in Europe as well as Canada. So this is an investigator-initiated trial, meaning that we are opening it at MD Anderson only. We are leading it. I'm the principal investigator of this trial. And we decided to take the best two drugs for kidney cancer in the salvage setting, nivolumab and MGSD516 or citravatinib, which is this drug that's similar to cabozantinib. So we wanted to take the best drug that targets the immune uh, system which is the immune checkpoint inhibitor, nivolumab, and the drug that's the best for targeting uh, the uh, cell, the, the, the signaling that the tumor cell uses, and uh, we combine these two. So patients who had one or two prior therapies with either sinitinib, pazopanib, or interleukin-2, but as long as they did not have an immune checkpoint inhibitor, mTOR inhibitor, or cabozantinib, they come in and they get treated on this trial, and we have, this is a trial that we're going to collect a lot of blood and biopsies before treatment is given and on therapy and at the time of progression. This is going to be a very informative trial. And we hope that if we show that the combination is better than nivolumab alone or better than cabozantinib, for example, what we know of these two drugs, because I showed you data, we pretty much know what you can expect if you treated uh, patients with kidney cancer in the salvage setting with one or the other drug. We, we pretty much know what to get. If we get here double the responses with the combination then we, we, we can expect to get with either one alone, then this trial is going to move forward for a phase three and we hope that that will be uh, a positive trial as well. So what is my forecast for the next say one, two, three years? How do I see the landscape shaping up? So you heard from Dr. Yonash that cabucentinib could be FDA approved in the next few months if the uh, review of the scans 
confirm the results that were reported by the investigator. And if cabozantinib then gets an indication, not just in the second line, third line, but in the first line, that's going to shake up the field. But there are several trials, and maybe Dr. Gao is going to mention about these trials in his talk, that basically are in the first line setting, and they are using combinations of an immune checkpoint with an immune checkpoint inhibitor, or an immune checkpoint inhibitor plus a target agent targeting this angiogenesis, the blood vessels. And he, here are those six trials, nivolumab plus ipilimab versus sunitinib. We participate and led that trial here at MD Anderson. The results are still pending. There's another one that also complete accrual using this immune checkpoint inhibitor, atezolizumab or tisentric plus bevacizumab versus sunitinib. And these are three trials that are now ongoing using an immune checkpoint inhibitor with the same agent axitinib here in these two trials and what I showed you here previously, lenvatinib plus uh, everolimus. So, and this is a trial that hasn't opened yet, but it combines nivolumab, cabozantinib versus nivolumab, ipilimumab, and cabozantinib. Again, in all those trials, the comparator that's being used is sunitinib because first line. So I think the results of these and what the FDA is going to do with cabozantinib uh, regarding its position in the first line will really shake up what will happen in the very near future, maybe in a year or two years, certainly by three years, what was going to happen in the salvage setting. But there will be also entry of new investigating agents in the second line space will affect the field. So some of the trials that I showed you, that the glutaminase inhibitor, CB839, the HIF2 alpha inhibitor, the, uh, the, the drug that I showed you, the MGSD 516. So if these get FDA approved, they're going to come here and occupy space. But there are some challenges and unmet needs, particularly predictive biomarkers. We still give all these therapies to all patients, say, with clear cell, and we don't know if they're going to respond or not because we don't have biomarkers. We don't have predictive factors, whether it's from the blood or the tumor that we can take a piece of the patient or their kidney tumor that tells us they're going to respond to this drug better than the other. So we don't, I showed you that PDL1 was hopeful that it would be a predictive, but in real cell carcinoma, unlike lung cancer, it was not a predictive factor. So there is really a pressing unmet need to identify predictive biomarkers to help us select these therapies to patients better to bring us to really the era of precision or personalized oncology, rather than give the, the same drug to everybody, knowing well that only a percentage of patients will respond and not all patients respond. And then the, the, the really unmet need, and, and it's, uh, it's a subject that's uh, 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 near and dear to my heart, which is the variant histology, because I've been focusing on this, uh, this group, diverse group of tumor types that so far we have not. And industry has not really uh, paid a lot of attention, as well as academic centers, because they're rare tumors. And I'm talking about chromophobe. I'm talking about papillary. I'm talking about renal medullary carcinoma, collecting tuck or Bellini's tumor. So those are, they constitute about 20, 25% of tumors of kidney cancer. But unfortunately, a lot of the data, a lot of the trials I showed you, and Dr. Yona showed you, and what you'll see, you'll hear from Dr. Gao, has been conducted in clear cell, the most common type. But there is hope. We are, we and others are, and finally industry is listening and has uh, come on board, and we will be launching some of the trials in these variant histologies, such as papillary. We have already launched some trials in the renal medullary carcinoma, a devastating uh, rare kidney cancer that afflicts young African-American with sickle cell trait. Thank you very much.